Welcome back to probabilistic machine learning lecture number six. Here is where we are in the course. Lecture one, we saw that probabilistic reasoning is a foundation for, or is an extension of propositional logic to reason with uncertainty. Lecture two, we saw that doing so can be computationally very hard and to make it feasible we have to find conditional independent structure in our reasoning problems. In lecture three, we extended this notion from discrete and binary distributions to continuous domains. In lecture four and five, we saw how to actually perform computations in such continuous probabilistic models. And one way to do so is to use random numbers to sample numbers with which we can then approximate integrals because integrals are the core operation we have to solve when we do probabilistic inference. Today we will begin the part of the course that is much more directly focused at actual applications, at really solving concrete inference problems. And we will do so using a framework in which sampling actually for a moment, for a while, is not going to be so important anymore. To achieve this we have to talk about this man, Carl Friedrich Gauss, one of the most prominent mathematicians of all time. And this actually, so this is, this is what German money used to look like when I was in high school. This is him, Karl Friedrich Gauss. And what you see here next to him is first of all the skyline of Göttingen where he taught. And um, in here a little curve that all of you have seen before. And in fact there is a, uh, a formula already printed over it that I can zoom into and this is the one dimensional version of the probability distribution that is named after him, the Gaussian distribution. Also known variably as the bell curve, the normal distribution, the central distribution and so on and so on. You can already tell from the fact that A, this guy used to be on the money and B, that this curve has so many names that it's clearly important. Now, usually at this point in the course I ask people why this distribution is important. And then I wait for a moment, so maybe you can think about this for yourself. And actually the right answer usually comes up. If you come from a mathematical background, maybe you've seen the Gaussian distribution introduced as the distribution that maximizes entropy given its first two moments, mean and variance. Maybe you've heard about the central limit theorem. I'm afraid to say both of these statements are not the core reason for the popularity of the Gaussian distribution. They are actually maybe more of a post hoc motivation for the use of this distribution. No, the real reason for the popularity of the Gaussian distribution is that it has beautiful convenient mathematical properties. And what we're going to do today over the course of this lecture and actually also the following ones is to new, like first get to know these wonderful properties, this is going to be today, and then make use of them to build real machine learning methods. In fact, to build maybe the foundational set of methods that cover a large part of what people might want to do with machine learning. Gaussian distributions are going to be an absolute fixture of the rest of this course. So, in advance, I should tell you that when there is some somewhat tedious math showing up today, then that's because we're going to use that math for the entire rest of the course. So I urge you to pay attention even when it sometimes gets a little bit tedious and we'll just do a bit of arithmetic. So this is the one dimensional version of this curve and it's described by this equation. So this is a probability density function for a random variable called x and this distribution has actually two parameters that are usually introduced. They are called sigma and mu typically. Um, we use a shortcut like this, a curly n for the normal distribution. That is a distribution over the random variable, ca variable capital X which takes values lowercase x on the real line, so for any real number x. And after the semicolon we write the two um, symbols for these two parameters of the distribution. It actually happens to be the case that, and I haven't shown this, but I can just tell you that this mu is equal to the, um, this location of the distribution. It's sometimes called the location. It's also equal to the mean, so the first moment of this distribution. 
It actually also happens to be the mode of this distribution, so the point where the distribution reaches its highest um, value. Sigma, which we um, are going to use this notation to write sigma squared, because sigma squared defines the variance of this distribution, so that's the expected square distance of draws of this distribution from the mean. That's why we write a square because then, um, because variances are expected squares, so we can talk about the square root of that expected square, which is sigma. This is the standard deviation of this distribution. You can see, and this is maybe more important, the algebraic form of this equation. It's an exponential of, I'm just going to show this here as a definition again, it's an exponential of a quadratic expression. So it's e to the minus and then a square, where the square is the distance to the mean, and then we divide by 2 times sigma squared. The 2 is there for uh, computational convenience in terms of the definition. Otherwise it could be absorbed into sigma, but many things are much easier if we leave that 2 around. The, um, in front of this exponential there is a normalization constant, which happens to be 1 over, well, the normalization constant is typically defined as the inverse of this, which is sigma times the square root of 2 pi. This is sometimes known as the Gaussian integral, even though it wasn't actually invented by Gauss, it was solved by Laplace. I'll have a quote of this uh, later on. So, um, the, a few interesting properties to begin with is this, so this is a probability distribution, which means it integrates to 1. It is Obviously, this number here is strictly larger than zero for any value x on the real line, any finite value x. Um, so this means this distribution has full support on the real line. It's also clearly symmetric, so if you exchange x and mu in this expression, then you get back the same thing because a square is symmetric around uh, this permutation. And um, maybe this is actually the most important way of thinking about the Gaussian distribution is that it's the exponential of a square. So we could also write this as e to the and then some polynomial that has a constant and a, and a linear term and a quadratic term. These would require us to use other parameters, let's call them eta and tau. These actually also have names but I'm going to use them much more rarely. Today we'll talk about them a little bit in the second half of the lecture. This tau is often called the precision and um, eta, which is equal to the precision times um, mu, is often called the precision adjusted mean. So you can already find a bug here in these slides between this, the definition with the square here and there. I'll fix that in a later version of the slides. Okay, so that's this univariate distribution. Actually, the univariate case is not so interesting. It's just much more intuitive. We'll come back to it. Um, we'll come back to the multivariate version, which is much more interesting in a few minutes. Before we do so, though, let's see why, let's see the first reason why this distribution might be so useful. And that is that the Gaussian family of distributions, so that's a distribution of, sorry, that's a family of distributions that is parameterized by the parameters mu and sigma squared. This family is closed under multiplication, and by that I mean the following. So let's say we want to do inference on a real number, something that has a value between minus infinity and plus infinity and we know it to be real. Then um, a typical assumption people make, and here we start to see what I mean by convenience is to just assume that the prior is Gaussian and assume that the likelihood is Gaussian. This isn't necessarily true in practice, but it's very convenient to do so for the following reason. If you multiply two Gaussian distributions, so if you assume that the thing you don't know, the variable capital X, uh, the random variable capital X, which takes values little x, is a Gaussian distributed a priori, and the probability to observe some measurement y given the true value x is also disturbed by Gaussian noise, as people would say, then scientists uh, in the quantitative sciences typically draw something like this. So they draw a measurement that's a circle and then arrow bars to the left and the right which are meant to be equal to nu, so or two times nu sometimes, so the width of this distribution. Then the posterior, so what you know about x having measured y, is given by Bayes' theorem, of course, which is here. And to do that, we have to multiply these two distributions with each other and then normalize. Now, if you do that, then you'll notice that 
Let me just do this in a moment. I need a pen. What we are multiplying here is, I'll write that down again, P of X, which is a Gaussian of X around mu sigma squared, and P of Y given X, which is equal to a Gaussian of mu around X with variance nu squared. Then to, to, put, to compute their product between the two, we need to take this times this. So each of these is an exponential of minus one half times x minus mu squared divided by sigma squared. And here with, well, let's write it like this, exponential of minus one half times x minus y squared divided by mu squared. Here I've already used that we can exchange x and y. I've left out the normalization constants because afterwards we're going to integrate over this distribution, right? To, to, do base, to, to do Bayesian inference, we will have to normalize by the evidence. And any constants in front of this expression that uh, doesn't, don't depend on x are going to be integrate, like part of the integral as well. And so they're going to cancel in the uh, denominator and the numerator of this fraction. So we actually really only have to care about the product between these two. So the product between two exponentials is equal to the sum of their arguments. So what we have to care about is the sum of these two, and that's a sum of squares. So that's a sum of two square polynomials. And of course that means that the sum is again going to be the square of a polynomial. Ah, sorry, it's going to be a polynomial of second order, right? A square, square uh, ex expression. So um, let's write that. Let's get rid of the minus one half because these are obviously in both in, in front of this. So we just need to do x plus mu squared over sigma squared plus x minus y squared over nu squared. So let's expand this expression. This is equal to x squared. I lost, lost a minus here. x squared minus 2x mu plus mu squared, the whole thing divided by sigma squared, plus x squared minus 2xy plus y squared divided by nu squared. Now, what we will get is, and uh, so this is actually high school math. What we're going to do <coughs> is called completing the square in English. If you're a German student, you might have heard of quadratische Ergänzung. So what we're going to do is we'll, it will collect all the terms in x that are, um, uh, in, that are of, of order x square and then all the, all the terms that are of order x. And then we'll push everything else into stuff that doesn't depend on, on x and try to construct another square expression. And then everything that we have to add to make this work will go into a constant that doesn't depend on x, which we can then drag out of this expression and put it into the normalization constant. So let's do that. We will get terms in x square, which are given by 1 over sigma square plus 1 over nu square times x square, convenient, plus um, an expression that has a 2 in front, of course. And then we get mu over sigma square plus y over nu square times x. And then we get some other stuff that doesn't depend on x. So if we want to have a square term, then we're going to have this, or actually the square root of this in front of our x. And we are, so therefore we can expand by this here, right? We'll have to add, multiply in one over sigma square plus one over nu square. And then the square root of that, because this is the square of it. And then we need this thing again, divide by it, so that we actually let's put the one half here and the minus one half there because then this is going to be our term in x. And this means that we will have here a term to complete which is given by one over sigma square plus one over nu square inverse. And there's no square root here because it's gonna be part of a square. And then we're left with mu over sigma square plus y over nu square. And then there's more stuff which doesn't depend on x. 
So this expression is going to be the square of 1 over sigma square plus 1 over nu square. And then the inverse of that times x square minus, and then this expression here, but the square root, of, uh, sorry, not the square, x minus the square root of this, which is um, which is boop, boop, 1 over sigma, we've taken one of these out already, so we have to multiply by it again, right? So that means what, that's why we actually keep this in the square, if you know what I mean. So it's going to be 1 over sigma square plus 1 over nu square inverse times mu over sigma square plus y over nu square square. And this is of the form of this Gaussian. So what we're going to get is, and actually by this I can go back to the, to the slides. A posterior that is Gaussian and it has a mean that is given by this complicated expression I just wrote on the board and a new variance that is given by this. And of course it has a normalization constant and you can work out for yourself what that normalization constant is. It turns out that this itself has the form that is also an exponential of a square, of course, because of the structure and um, therefore can also be written as an evaluation of a Gaussian probability density function at locations that don't depend on x. So why is this cool? Because, so first of all, we can think a little bit about what these numbers actually mean here. So once we've seen a data point and we've measured it with a precision that is inversely proportional to nu square, and uh, we have a prior uncertainty that is somehow scaled by sigma square. So notice I'm using the word uncertainty for the variance here because of course uncertainty is the width of the distribution then um, we get a new estimate that is of the same form. It's also a Gaussian distribution and it has a new location that is given by the weighted, the two weighted estimates. So we have a, an initial estimate mu and an observation y and both of these come with error bars that scale like sigma and nu. And now what we do is we weigh each of these measurements by the error and then normalize the error essentially so that we get a new weighted estimate for the, for the correct value and um, a new variance that is given by the inverse of the sum of the inverses of the uncertainty. So if you think of these as precisions, then the new precision is the sum of the precisions of the individual measurements. You had a prior and then a measurement. So this here is the prior, the black line. The blue thing is the measurement. And our new estimate is more certain than either of these because it, it combines information from both sources of information by weighing them relative to their individual error. And therefore, the more precise measurement, in this case, that's the observation, gets, us, gets sort of weighted more and gets us closer to the observation. This can be extended to more than just one observation because we now have another Gaussian distribution after this one measurement. So if we have many such IID measurements, then the, the situation is similar to what we observed in the example of the beta distribution with what's the proportion of people wearing glasses. Just now we're measuring not a, not a probability, but a real number with various measurements. Then we have a similar kind of situation of what's called as a conjugate prior. So this um, Gaussian distribution multiplied by a Gaussian likelihood is another Gaussian posterior over the quantity we care about. So now if we keep having more and more of these measurements, we will always at every point in time have a Gaussian distribution as a current posterior estimate and we can keep updating this by keeping track of these numbers that are coming in. A convenient way to do this is to store the inverse of the variance and the inverse of the variance times the mean, because then we can just sum up these individual um, uh, parameters of the likelihoods that come in. These quantities here are called sufficient statistics, and I will tell you later in the course why, but it's already convenient to just know that this is a name that will come up. This is nice, why? Because we're doing Bayesian inference, so we're tr keeping track of uncertainty, and we don't have to keep track of a very complicated high-dimensional integral 
so, so in the general case, right, if we just had joint distributions over y and x, then we would have to solve here a complicated expression, so a univariate integral over lots and lots and lots of complicated terms that get multiplied together. And instead of having to do that, all we need to do is to just sum a bunch of floating point numbers. And you know, of course, that computers are good at summing floating point numbers. It's about the fastest thing you can do. So therefore, this operation is massively more efficient than to keep track of the abstract notion of what Bayesian inference would tell us to do. So even though you might be unhappy with the choice of having to use Gaussian distributions for everything, because I haven't really motivated them beyond the algebraic uh, properties, you have to, re like, I hope you will agree with me that it's absolutely beautiful, at least in the one dimensional case, that we can keep track of uncertainty after an arbitrary number of observations simply by keeping around sums of real numbers, of floating point numbers on a computer. This is similar to the situation with uh, the binary observations, someone wearing glasses, someone not wearing glasses, which were a different kind of variable. It's a probability, right? Um, now it's a real number. And this choice of Gaussian distribution makes this kind of computation particularly easy. And by the way, so um, here's a short historical note. There's an argument about who actually came up with the Gaussian distribution. It's a bit complicated. Um, there's also a lot of egos involved. Gauss was a very confident man. His contemporaries, and particularly Laplace and also Legendre, where um, Legendre was slightly before him actually, were uh, also big egos. And um, one could argue over who came up with this first. So Gauss wrote a famous um, treatise about the movement of planets, in Latin of course, this is just a German translation, um, in which he, he, he constructed a framework for building estimates of the, of the trajectories of planets around the sun, which are ellipses, so they are intersections of cones, and um, in there he came up with a, with a way, he basically invented almost all of modern linear algebra, if you like, um, and maybe even inference. So he comes up with a way of making measurements and combining them together by summing their squares and then constructs even a notion of uncertainty that is essentially this probability distribution. He does this in here and you can tell from the text that he's really trying to keep the computations uh, uh, possible for himself. And later on, in a moment, we'll talk about the multivariate version of this. He actually has to solve systems of equations. So he comes up with the Gaussian elimination framework, which is what we use today to do linear algebra. And uh, nevertheless, though, there is an interesting point here that um, at some point he needs to know the integral over this expression. So here it is, our e to the mm, plus one half times a constant. So he uses a different notational style. And then there's a square here. So notice that um, Gauss doesn't yet have uh, the symbols with the little subscript two. Uh, superscript 2, so instead he just writes delta times delta to, to say the square. He needs a normalization constant, so he needs the integral over this thing here, and then actually admits himself that this integral was not solved by him, even though it's now called the Gaussian integral. In fact, it's solved by Laplace, and he cites the correct um, thing down here, and then he actually has to sort of go on a little bit with his big ego that he actually came up with it as well. So he says, um, uh, he says, well, I actually say that Laplace kind of came up with this, but it can actually be derived from a theorem that um, he has had in one of his earlier papers before, La before Laplace solved it. But actually Euler came up with a solution to this integral, but he's sort of, I mean, only to a variant of it, and he derives the form of this integral himself a little bit earlier. But he couldn't put it in his, in his text because the, the errata were too late. So, you know, he didn't, he, he, he's happy to say this is Laplace's work, right? So here you can see people, depending on which country you're coming from, you might call this a Laplacian integral if you like. Um, you might call it a Gaussian integral or an Eulerian integral if you're a Swiss. It doesn't really matter. So um, interestingly, maybe as a historical factoid, Laplace actually had to solve this integral because he wanted to actually solve the beta integral, which he didn't know how to solve. So he made an approximation, which we will talk about in a later lecture. And that approximation required him to solve this one now called now so-called Gaussian integral. So basically Laplace invented the Gaussian distribution to approximate a beta distribution.
Now, of course, the one-dimensional version of this distribution is not particularly interesting because typically we don't want to reason about individual quantities and then directly observe that quantity with noise. Much more frequently, we're going to have to deal with multiple variables that relate to each other. And for that, we need a multivariate version of this distribution. And thankfully, it exists and it actually inherits all of the beautiful properties of the univariate case. There's almost nothing that the univariate Gaussian can do that the multivariate can't do. However, to do so, we will have to deal with multivariate calculus and that will give, like, mean that we will have to deal with a lot of linear algebra. So, fair warning, the rest of this lecture will be essentially all about linear algebra. And if you need to brush up on your linear algebra knowledge, then maybe after you've watched this lecture, go back and Google a few terms. So, the multivariate version of the Gaussian distribution is also going to be the exponential of a square, but now we need a multivariate square. The multivariate version of a quadratic function is known as a quadratic form. It has this form. Here we will now assume that x and also the parameter mu are vectors, so they are collections of real numbers of length n. And um, we construct a real number by taking the inner product of such vectors scaled by such a matrix, which we will now, we'll now call sigma. So this matrix sigma will replace the variance sigma square as a multivariate version of this. For this to work, we have to make sure that up here there will only ever be positive numbers because otherwise e to the minus a negative number might be something that can get very large and we, don't, we might not necessarily be able to normalize this distribution. In fact, then we won't be able to normalize it to a probability density. So therefore, this matrix has to make sure that this inner product is always a, a number larger or equal than zero and such matrices that have this property that any inner product of any vector from the left and right to such a matrix is always larger than zero are called positive definite matrices. So we want this matrix to be symmetric positive definite and such matrices are called, uh, well such, this word just means that this matrix is symmetric and that for arbitrary vectors v this inner product is always larger than or equal to zero. So minor note on notation because I know that there's always someone in the audience who's really careful about this very precisely speaking, what I have written here is the definition of, of, of a positive semi-definite matrix because there's an equal sign here as well. Um, to be strictly definite, this equal sign shouldn't be there. In this part of the community, however, it has become a, a customary to just call this definition semi-definite anyway because sorry, to call this definition positive definite anyway, because the semi-definite version is such a um, sort of notational annoyance and it's easy to deal with. So we will just call, when I, when I say I'm talking about a positive definite matrix, I actually mean something that has, that fulfills this definition with the equal sign. Okay, so this gives us now a way to take, um, to define a probability distribution over multivariate quantities that are elements of the real vector space. And this distribution now looks something like this. This is a two-dimensional plot. So it's some kind of cloud in this multivariate space. It has a center. This center is given by the vector that is given by mu. This vector is actually still the mean of this distribution. And it has a shape. And the shape of this distribution is given by, maybe you can think about this for yourself for a second, if you don't know, it's given by the eigenvectors of this positive definite matrix sigma, symmetric positive definite matrix sigma. If you don't remember anymore what an eigenvector and an eigenvalue is or a matrix, then please look it up at this point. So um, actually you can think about which of these two directions is the large or the small eigenvector of sigma. This is always a little bit twisted around because they're in the definition to be similar to the definition of the variance of the univariate case, we have an inverse of this matrix here. By the way, if this matrix is positive semi-definite and there are zero eigenvalues, then the inverse is a little bit tricky to define, but I'll get to that a little bit later. It's relatively straightforward to deal with this. There are just notions in linear algebra that, that ensure that this all works for us.
So, just as before for the univariate case, this Gaussian multivariate distribution has a lot of nice properties, but they extend way beyond what is currently on this slide. Nevertheless, this function integrates to one, so it's a probability density function because it is strictly larger than zero for any real vector x. It um, uh, is normalized by this expression here, which is a multivariate generalization of what we had for the univariate case. There is still a 2 pi here, but is now taken, or square root of 2 pi, but is now taken to the power of the dimension of the input space. And this expression here is supposed to be the determinant of this matrix sigma. Again, if you don't remember what a determinant of a matrix is, please look it up. You can think of it as measuring essentially some kind of volume described by this function. This function is also still symmetric under exchanges of the roles of the parameters x at uh, the variable x and the parameter mu because you can flip x and mu here and then that happens on both sides and clearly no, nothing changes. And it can also still be written as the exponential of a polynomial function. You have to be a bit careful now because the polynomial is now a multivariate polynomial. So it involves a constant and a linear term and a quadratic term and the parameters of these linear and quadratic terms still are called precision for this matrix lambda, which happens to be the inverse of sigma. And the precision adjusted mean, if you like, which is the product of the precision and the mean, and that's called eta. And um, there are now here the linear term and the quadratic term in X. By the way, this can be rewritten as this inner product can be written as a trace over this other matrix, just as a side note. Okay, so the kind of derivations I just did for the univariate case here on the whiteboard behind me still carry over to the multivariate case. I'm not going to do the derivations again because they are a little bit tedious. If you want to, you can do them for yourselves. So it's still true that the product of our two Gaussian distributions <coughs> is itself a Gaussian. So I have to be careful here with what I say. The product of two Gaussian probability density functions. So of these functions here, which we call curly n, which are a map from x to the real numbers, the positive real numbers. If you multiply two of these, that's equal to another Gaussian distribution and a normalization constant. This is not the same as talking about the distribution of the product of two Gaussian random variables. If you're confused by that sentence, maybe stop the video here and think about it for the moment. What this means is that if we measure a Gaussian random variable twice or multiple times, each time with a likelihood that is Gaussian, then the posterior will again be Gaussian because the function of these, uh, sorry, the product of these two functions is, what is that? Well, it's the product of two exponentials of a quadratic form. So it's an exponential of the sum of two quadratic forms. And the sum of two quadratic forms is another quadratic form. And it has parameters which are actually given here by the stuff on the slide. So the new covariance, um, that's what this matrix is called, the covariance matrix C, after uh, taking the, uh, of the product of the, uh, the distribution that arises from taking the product of these two Gaussian PDFs, is given by the inverse of the sum of the inverses of the covariances. So this means the new precision is the sum of the precisions of the observations. The new mean is a more complicated expression, which is the, uh, the precision of the, sorry, is the covariance of, the, of, of the, the resulting distribution times a weighted sum of the means of the two, of the two input distributions. So, why is this important? It's important for the same reason that it was important in the univariate case to compute posterior distributions after Gaussian observations. We have to do operations that are easy on a computer. These operations are a little bit more tedious than what I showed you in the univariate case because they involve as the most important, well, as a basic operation, they involve the product of a matrix with a vector, a matrix vector product. Nevertheless, this is something a computer can very efficiently do, especially with GPUs. And it involves the inverse of matrices or the sum of inverses inverted. And this inversion operation is expensive. We might talk about this a little bit in the flipped classroom, but it is still an operation that a computer is very efficient at solving. <coughs> 
So here's a little picture of what I mean by this. If you take this Gaussian, maybe let's call it a prior, and you multiply it with a likelihood that is itself Gaussian, then the product of these two probability density functions that's different from the distribution or the product of these two random numbers is itself a Gaussian distribution. Because these two clouds of uncertainty, when multiplied together, actually, and then normalized again, become itself a Gaussian distribution. By the way, the normalization constant which we have to compute to compute this integral is itself an expression that can be computed in the form of the PDF of a Gaussian. It's not a Gaussian PDF because it's over the parameters rather than over x, but it's an expression that can be computed by evaluating a Gaussian probability density function. That, however, is not the only beautiful property of Gaussian distributions. There are many more and they all boil down to the fact that quadratic functions are just really nice because um, they aren't, it's not, not just the case that the sum of two quadratic functions is another quadratic function. It's also the case, for example, that the projection of a quadratic function onto a univariate subspace is itself, again, a quadratic function. So if you have a random variable that is Gaussian distributed like this, with a mean and a covariance given by this red cloud. And now you're interested in the projection of this random variable onto any other space defined by a linear projection. So if you consider a matrix A and consider the random variable that is given by A times Z. So clearly this is a mapping of Z. So therefore this is a random variable, but it's a linear mapping. Then it turns out, and I'm not going to show this, I'm just going to tell you that the distribution of this derived random variable is also a Gaussian distribution and it has a mean that is very easy to compute. It's just given by applying the linear operator to, or this linear matrix, this matrix, sorry, to the mean and it has a new variance or covariance that is given by applying this matrix from the left and the right. So multiplying sigma from the left with A and from the right with A transpose and uh, so here's a picture for that, right? If you think of this multivariate distribution, that's the distribution over Z, and then consider the variable that is given by projecting this entire distribution onto this line, then out comes a Gaussian distribution. And the mean of that distribution is just a projection of the mean onto this space. And the variance of the distribution is just the projection of the covariance of this distribution onto this space. By the way, this doesn't just work for univariate projections, so for where A is a row vector, it also works for general linear maps. We will make use of that a lot. This is another great property of Gaussian distributions, but there are way more. So in particular, it's not just, well actually, so there's a special case of this where we choose uh, the, so if we choose the projection A, to be a row vector that is a unit row vector, so it has a one somewhere and then a zero everywhere else, then what we're essentially doing here is we're computing the marginal of an, of an individual variable. So uh, to get, right, you can imagine you have a joint distribution over x and y, then if you apply this a from the left to this vector, then you just get x, right? So what this, what this expression on the previous slide says is that if you have a joint Gaussian distribution over multiple variables, x, y, z, and so on, and you care only about one of the marginal distributions of this, uh, of this joint, let's say over x, then that marginal is itself a Gaussian, A, and B, it has a very, very simple accessible form. The, to get the mean of this distribution, just pick out the corresponding entry of the mean vector, and to get the covariance of this distribution, just pick out the corresponding sub-matrix of um, this joint covariance matrix. This is amazing because it means that if you have a model to do inference with that has a very high dimensional representation over a large space, but you only care about a part of that space, then that's easy to do because you just pick out individual parts of the distribution. It's also actually maybe a dangerous pro property of Gaussian distributions that we have to deal with later on, which Sort of another way to phrase this is if you have a complicated model over many, many parameters, or many, many variables, and you only care about one part of them, then having a Gaussian model corresponds to treating that subpart of the, of the joint 
as if you could just drop all the other variables. So that's property number one. And notice that essentially this allows us to define a kind of sum rule for Gaussian distributions. So if you have a joint distribution over two variables and you care about only one of them, then you have to compute a marginal. And for Gaussians, this operation, the sum rule operation, is very easy. It amounts to, well, it's not even linear algebra. It's just selecting from a list or an array. It's also true, and this is a different property, that not projections of Gaussians, but cuts through Gaussians are Gaussians. So if you have a quadratic function and you take any linear cut through that function, that's itself a quadratic function. So therefore, if you condition a Gaussian, that means cut through a Gaussian at one point, let's say here, then the corresponding mm, distribution is itself a Gaussian distribution. So um, uh, here is the corresponding rule for this. It's a little bit tedious. It says, given like, uh, the, the conditional distribution for a variable uh, x, given that a linear projection of, um, a, of, of x is given by y, is given by this corresponding like, definition of the conditional distribution, which happens to be itself a Gaussian. Now, why this is exactly the case takes a little bit of time to derive, and I want to do more interesting, fun stuff with you, so I'm just going to tell you that it is of this form. It is an, itself a Gaussian distribution that is given, that has a parameter that is given by the mean element of this, uh, the Gaussian marginal over x, plus, and then there's an annoying complicated expression that we will talk about in a minute, but what you can see here is that it only involves matrices and vectors and the inverses of matrices. So these are linear algebra operations, and computers are good at linear algebra. So therefore, this property basically defines a form of conditional, uh, well, conditional distribution or product rule for Gaussian distributions. So if you have a joint Gaussian distribution over several variables, and you care about the conditional of one of them given the others, you can construct a corresponding marginal, that, or a corresponding conditional. That conditional is Gaussian. And its parameters, mean and variance, mean and covariance, are given by quantities that can be computed using linear algebra. This um, can also be summarized here. So I have written it down again. So um, maybe a little bit more clearly. So if you have a, pr um, a prior distribution over variable x that um, is Gaussian with mean and variance, and then you make observations of another variable, y, that is a conditional distribution that is also Gaussian over the observed variable. And the mean is a linear map of the quantity you care about, x, with some covariance, lambda. And maybe it can even be an affine map. So it's a linear mapping plus a shift. Then the rules of probability that are usually complicated, sum and product rule and the posterior distribution that involve complicated integrals, for Gaussians, actually reduce to linear algebra. So the marginal distribution over y, which is the evidence term in Bayes' theorem, actually is of the form of a Gaussian quantity. Why is that? It's because the product of two Gaussians, so here is a Gaussian and there is a Gaussian, and we take the product of the two. These are essentially two Gaussians over x, because um, the Gaussians are symmetric under exchanges of uh, the variable and its parameter. Um, is itself a Gaussian, and the normalization constant is also of a Gaussian form. And here is that normalization constant. It's given by this expression. And notice that these expressions just involve linear algebra. They're just matrix vector products. And the posterior distribution is a, a Gaussian distribution over x with a new mean and a variance. And sorry, here is the mean, and here is the variance. And that new mean and variance is given by linear algebra operations. We'll actually take a moment now to, to talk about exactly what these linear algebra operations do and what the terms in there actually mean. But before we do so, it's more important first to realize why this is cool. Because it maps the otherwise complicated probabilistic inference onto linear algebra. So we saw in lecture two that probabilistic inference can be combinatorially hard. So exponentially hard in the number of variables in our model. But if you have joint Gaussian models, then the inference 
consists of linear algebra. And if you've done any linear algebra before, then you know that the cost of linear algebra operations is polynomial rather than exponential. In fact, the cost of this is at most cubic in the number of variables in x. Or y, and or y, actually. So when we use Gaussian distributions for everything, and of course we sometimes have to question whether we're allowed to do that, but when we do so, then inference, probabilistic inference, reasoning with uncertainty, boils down from integration, which is hard and combinatorially complex, to linear algebra, which is easy to implement and polynomially hard. What exactly are the computations we have to do? So if we have a variable called x that we care about and we have a prior over it that's Gaussian and we make observations called y that are linear maps of x up to Gaussian noise, then the posterior over x is a Gaussian with a mean that is given by the following expression. You take the prior mean, that's the mean that we had before we got to see an observation, and then here is a complicated expression that if you stare at it for a while separates into here an expression that is a vector, so y is a vector, that's the observation, minus, um, a, this is essentially a prediction, so this is the marginal, that's the mean of the marginal distribution, so that is, if you ask the prior over x what y might well be, then you would predict it, its mean would be this expression, and then you take the difference between the two, this is called the residual, it's how far what you actually got to see is away from what you would have predicted this number to be. And then you scale it by this expression, which is called the Gram matrix, it shows up over here again. This, is, um, this expression is actually the marginal variance of y, so this is the scale on which we expect y to lie. And then we have to invert that. So what we're essentially computing here is a corrected residual. We're saying how far is the measurement away from the prediction on a scale defined by how far we expect the measurement to be away from the prediction. And then we project back onto the space of x where we actually care about. This expression here is sometimes called the gain because it multiplies the residual by a linear map. Computing this object uh, is, so this part is easy, this part is easy, the hard part is this matrix inverse here matrix inverses are cubically expensive in the size of this matrix. This is a square matrix because A is on the left and the right hand side and it has size that is uh, equal to on each side to the length of Y and we need to invert this. The corresponding covariance matrix, so essentially the multivariate error bar on this measurement is given by the prior Covariance, let's call that a covariance an uncertainty because that's what it is, it's a width of the distribution. So what we know once we've seen y is what we knew before, what our uncertainty was before, and then the uncertainty is reduced by the measurement by an expression that involves um, an outer product, if you like, or maybe an inner product, depending about how you think about these quantities, of the, this, vector, uh, this matrix, or yeah, in general matrix here that we already had in the mean, and the inverse of this gram matrix that we also had in the mean. So one nice thing about this is that these quantities show up twice in the mean and the variance. So once we've computed this inverse or it's solved, like figured out how to compute with these inverses, this operation here does not add additional computational cost to this one. Which means in the Gaussian framework, we get uncertainty for free. Once we have computed our point estimate, we get the uncertainty for free. Now, by the way, there is a really interesting um, reformulation of this, so this is one important equation that we're going to be making use of over and over again. And there's another form for this, expression, for this expression, so the exact same distribution can also be written by rewriting this complicated expression here in a different fashion, which is to take another matrix, which is given by the inverse of the prior covariance plus A transpose times the precision of the likelihood times A, inverted, times the, what you could call the, the weighted, the precision weighted means. So this is the prior mean times the prior precision plus uh, the shifted observation times the precision of the measurement multiplied with A from the left hand side. And the corresponding posterior covariance is given by this expression which we already have up here. This is the sort of the new, the posterior precision inverted. So why is it useful to have both of these forms? Because x and y can be of different size. So notice that we make observation of a linear projection of x, 
So it could be that y is a real number and x is a long vector. Or it could be that y is a long vector and many, many measurements that containing many, many measurements of x. And x is a small thing. Maybe x has only three entries, but we have 20 measurements of, of, of x. Then depending on the relative size of the vector y and the vector x relative to each other, the matrices that show up in these expressions are of different sizes. This matrix here is of size length of y squared. And this matrix here is of size length of x squared. So if x is larger than y, it makes more sense to represent this, to use this representation, because then we only have to invert a smaller matrix. But if x is smaller than y, so if you have many measurements of a smaller set of variables, then it's better to use this representation, because then this matrix is smaller. And because the computational cost of this entire operation is dominated by computing essentially this matrix inverse, it's important to think about which way around to do this matrix inverse. This idea that the, these, uh, this, this posterior distribution basically can be represented or the parameters of this distribution can be computed in two different ways is actually due to one of the most prominent mathematicians of the 21st century, arguably. His name is uh, Isai Shur. He was um, born in what was then the Russian Empire in present-day Latvia. He uh, was a member of the German Jewish community there. He moved to Berlin to study and uh, after his PhD, in which he actually already worked on linear algebra and basically worked on the, the, the result that we're using here, uh, he moved to Bonn where he became the successor of Hausdorff and was a professor there for more than a decade. Schur is one example of the brilliant minds that Germany lost in the eve, on the eve of the Second World War. He was forced to uh, leave his academic position because he was of Jewish faith and he had to move first to Switzerland and then was forced to give up a lot of his uh, or a large part of his fortune or almost all of it before emigrating to Israel uh, which was then called Palestine in um, 1939 where he soon died at a relatively young age of 66 probably or maybe at least partly because of the psychological stress of having to emigrate. This is a sad story, but the result that we're using here is absolutely beautiful and it's only weakly represented by this, by this linear or representation in form of matrices. It's actually a more general statement that Shore provided for um, general groups, well, relatively general groups, but it's simple to understand in this form this, um, the, the fact that we can rewrite this expression like this expression is due to the fact that X and Y have a joint Gaussian distribution, which has a joint covariance matrix. And the inverse of that joint covariance matrix can be written in two different ways um, or can be computed in part, or it contains two matrices that can be computed in part from each other. This, um, can be written in the following form as a statement that is known as the matrix inversion lemma or also as, an, unfortunately we can't call it Shor's lemma because Shor's lemma is something else actually, that name is already taken, um, but uh, it is saying that we can write inverses of matrices that have this kind of block structure, which is essentially any matrix, as long as the following quantities have inverses wherever I use them by computing first this object, which is due to Shor named the Shor complement of this matrix and then computing the individual terms in the inverse in this particular form. Now you can see this kind of expression show up in here and in here and um, you can use these to construct inverses of matrices. The same trick can, uh, be also, can also be used to compute the inverses of matrices that have this kind of form. So the inverse of a matrix that can be written as one matrix of which you might know the inverse plus this expression which could be for example a complicated out, uh, inner product um, or outer product of so for example u and v might just be vectors so it's a, a, a sort of a lengthy expression with a small matrix w inside. The inverse of this matrix can be written as the inverse of this matrix which we might know already maybe it's the inverse of the prior covariance which we've previously computed minus a correction term which involves uh, this then in this case much smaller matrix so if u and v are vectors then this is just a scalar. The same result can also be used to compute determinants of matrices. So 
Um, and this is called the matrix determinant lemma. This is called the matrix inversion lemma. This is called the matrix determinant lemma. And this is basically, these two basically relate to each other. I'm showing you this partly because this is a really cool tool. And if you're working with Gaussian distributions, then you are going to have to use this a lot. But also partly to highlight that all of the computational challenges we now have to solve if we're using Gaussian distributions are not integrals anymore. They are just linear algebra. Linear algebra problems are not necessarily trivial to solve. They require knowledge like this, but they can be solved using linear expressions rather than potentially combinatorially hard or totally intractable integrals. Because of this property, Gaussian distributions map all of probabilistic inference onto linear algebra. So product of Gaussians are Gaussians. That means that the, um, that if you get two sources of information about a, a, a random variable and they're both of Gaussian form, then the resulting distribution is also Gaussian. Linear projections of Gaussians are Gaussians, which means that if you have any set of variables and you want to reason about linear projections of them, and if the original variables are Gaussian distributed, then the marginal distributions are Gaussian distributed. In particular, this means that marginals of Gaussian distributions are Gaussians because a marginal is a specific kind of operation of this form. And conditionals of Gaussians, at least when conditioned on linear operations, are Gaussians. Therefore, because this, this is essentially the sum rule and this is essentially the product rule, because the sum and product rule map um, onto linear algebra if everything is Gaussian and linear, inference in the probabilistic sense, so Bayesian inference, if you're computing posteriors using Bayes' theorem, also involve just linear algebra expressions. So if you have a variable that is Gaussian distributed under the prior, and you make observations of linear projections of that variable, in particular this includes directly measuring this variable, where the measurements are corrupted by what's called Gaussian noise. So if they are distributed according to a Gaussian distribution around a mean that is a linear projection of the variable we care about, then the posterior distribution and actually all linear maps of it is again a Gaussian distribution. And those expressions then are maybe tedious to write down and at first sight they look really complicated. You have to stare at them for a while to see them. But the important part is that all operations that show up here are just linear algebra. They are not complicated, untractable integrals. They're just linear algebra. And therefore, Gaussian distributions essentially map all of inference, all of probabilistic inference, onto linear algebra. Linear algebra is something that a computer can do very well. And that's, this explains why Gaussian distributions are so prominent in probabilistic machine learning because they allow us to keep track of all of these complicated objects in a very simple way just by doing linear algebra. This slide isn't gray, but you can think of it as a gray slide and take a break here and stare at these expressions for a bit. All right, for the remaining part of this lecture for the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to use that time to introduce two very basic examples for the use of the Gaussian distribution for simple inference tasks. The goal of these examples is simultaneously to give you an insight into how this Gaussian machinery that I produced in this abstract fashion here is actually used and also to tie a connection between the Gaussian distributions we've been talking about today and what we've done in lecture two when we uh, thought in an abstract way about conditional independent structure, then on discrete variables, and now I'd like to talk about continuous variables. These two examples come from a really cool text by David Mackay called The Humble Gaussian Distribution, which I've cited up here. The first example contains three variables. So consider the following situation. Let's say we want to talk about the temperature in a building or two different buildings and the temperature outside. So let's say um, we're measuring, we might potentially measure temperature in one of these three places. So there are two buildings that might be quite close to each other. And evidently, of course, the temperature in both buildings on the inside depends on what the temperature on the outside is. It not, doesn't necessarily have to be the same though, because the two buildings are maybe different or the measurements are in different rooms that are affected by the sunlight from the outside in a different way. So let's introduce 
three random variables, which we will call x1 and x2 and x3, and they correspond to the temperature in building one, outside, and in building two. Now, how are we going to build a, a general probabilistic model for this? We can write down a graphical model like this, just intuitively already, but also um, by, like, I mean, this, this graph also actually encodes assumptions about the generative process producing the temperatures. What is temperature? Uh, what, 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 so, so let's say there is an outside process that produces X2. It could be the sun shining from like above onto the ground. Now, given X2, we can reason about what, what X1 might be. X1 is going to be, and let's make the following simple linear assumption. It might be a linear function of X2. So this W1 is a weight that might have something to do with the, con the temperature conductivity of the walls and how many windows this building has. It's just some number times the outside temperature plus um, a disturbance that, is, that depends on the building. Now, in general, of course, you would like this function here to be as complicated as possible to capture every single, single thing you're currently thinking of. And later on in the course, we'll come to models that can do this kind of stuff. But today, for simplicity, let's just assume, A, that there's a linear relationship between x2 and x1, and B, that the disturbance relative to the value of x2 is a Gaussian random variable. It's just some form of uncertainty that we decide to capture by a Gaussian distribution. We will also assume that there's a similar relationship for the, uh, the other building, for the temperature in building two, which we call x3, confusingly. That's going to be also a linear function of the outside temperature plus another disturbance. And this other disturbance has nothing to do with the disturbance in building one because it's a different building. But we'll also assume that it can be modeled in a Gaussian distribution. Now, what might the outside temperature be, x2? Well, again, we might need, well, in principle, we would have to use a complicated distribution that captures all the aspects of the outside world. But for simplicity, let's just say that's a Gaussian random variable as well. So the probability distribution for this uh, tem uh, temperature nu2 is given by a Gaussian distribution with a mean and a variance. And the assumptions we've made here is essentially that these three numbers are independent of each other. So that they, um, um, this is the assumption up here. So we will assume that these three disturbances, so the outside temperature, the disturbance in building one, and the disturbance in building three, and that these are three different processes that have nothing to do with each other. So they are independent of each other. That doesn't mean though that x1, x2, and x3 are independent of each other. It just means that new one, new two, and new three are independent of each other. What's the corresponding distribution of the variables x, x1, x2, x3. These are random variables and they are a linear map of nu1, nu2, and nu3. So x2 is just nu2. So we can write x2, uh, or, we, or we can introduce a linear map A, which maps from nu to x, and the second entry in x is x2, which is just nu2. So that's 0 times nu1, 1 times nu2, 0 times nu2, and uh, nu3. Okay? What's x1? x1 is um, the disturbance nu1. So there's a 1 here. This comes from here. Then it's w1 times x2, which is itself nu2. Right? So we can plug this directly in here. Otherwise, it would have to construct a more complicated map. And then it's 0 times nu3. There's no nu3 in x1. And finally, for x3, we have 0 times nu1. There is no nu1 in this expression. Then w3 times nu2, which is equal to x2, plus nu3. So there's a 1 in here. Now we can use the properties of the Gaussian distribution, which is that I'm going to use the sentence, the Gaussians are closed under linear maps, to mean more precisely this property here. We can use this to derive what the implied distribution is over x1, x2, and x3. And it's this Gaussian distribution, because this is a Gaussian distribution, and this is a linear map. And therefore, 
x, which is a linear map of nu, will also be a Gaussian distributed random variable with a mean that is given by applying a to the mean of nu and a covariance matrix sigma, which arises from applying a from the left and the right to this diagonal matrix with entries sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Now, if you do this, you can do that by hand, then you arrive at, well, an obvious uh, mean, which is just, you know, nu1 plus w1 nu2, nu2, and w3 nu2 plus nu3. That's this. And then this complicated matrix, where, this is sometimes confusing to people, I've decided only to print the upper triagonal part of this matrix because this is a symmetric matrix. So therefore, these parts down here are just the symmetric equivalents of these. I've learned over time that some people are confused by me writing matrices like this and other people are confused by me writing down symmetric matrices with all the entries doubled because they think there are so many numbers in there to look at. So on this slide I'm going to just show the upper triangular part and then on subsequent uh, slides I'm going to show the full matrix. Now what can we read off from this structure in this matrix? So remember um, when we wrote this graphical model before then, so first of all, this implies that the joint distribution over x1, x2, x3 can be written as p of x2 times p of x1 given x2 times p of x3 given x2. We know from lecture two that this kind of fan out structure implies that, first of all, given x2, x1 and x3 should be independent of each other. And when we marginalize out, the marginal over x1 and x3 should not, in general, be independent. What, which of these properties can we read off from this distribution? Well, we have to look at the covariance matrix, which captures the structure of relationships between these matrices. And it's the only part of the Gaussian distribution where such structure can be stored. So what we can first read off is in this covariance matrix, the statement about the marginal about x1 and x3. Why? Because remember that one of the properties of the Gaussian distribution is that marginals of Gaussians are Gaussians. So to get a marginal distribution, we just have to pick out a submatrix. So the submatrix for the marginal distribution over x1 and x3 is the matrix that consists of this term, and then this term, and the term down here, and the symmetric part here. And notice that on this off-diagonal entry, so on, on, on the diagonals we just see the marginal variances of the individual variables, that's fine. But the off-diagonal entry here is non-zero, unless w1 and w3, uh, or, or w3 are zero. So um, unless, right, x, x3 or x1 don't actually depend on x2. So in general, this here is um, a non-zero number. And therefore, these two variables now depend on each other. If you know something about one of these variables, you know something about the other variable as well. The structure of this graphical model, though, also includes another information, which is that when we condition on x2, then these two variables become independent of each other. We cannot read this off from this matrix, actually, but there is another matrix we can construct from it where we can read this off. And one way to do that would be to take this matrix and invert it and see that, look at the precision matrix of this, of this uh, Gaussian, which we actually need when we you know, evaluate this Gaussian distribution. I'm not going to do that, though, because inverting a 3 by 3 matrix is a little bit tedious. Instead, I'm actually going to write down the generative um, model that arises essentially from this kind of structure and do that. So here is our graph again. I've just copied it over. This is the same equation as before. It's just on the previous slide. Now I've moved it over. And now for simplicity, let's assume that we set the means here to zero. This is purely so that the notation becomes shorter and we don't have to look at so many different terms. Um, you can, if you do that, then you can think of nu1, nu2, nu and nu3 not as the actual temperatures outside in these two buildings uh, and disturbances of the buildings, but as offsets from their mean. So nu2 is now not the temperature outside anymore. It's the deviation of the outside temperature from its mean temperature and so on. If we do that, then uh, things get simpler. So now this means we can now, um, we can first write down the joint distribution uh, for x1, x2, and x3, which is encoded in this graph. So that's what I just already said. 
Um, if you can see the color, I'm going to use color to keep these uh, terms in X3 and, uh, and from, from these individual like, quantities um, separate from each other. If you don't see the color, it doesn't matter. You will still be able to follow along. And um, so this factorization amounts to saying that there are actually three different Gaussian distributions here. There's a Gaussian distribution for X2, which is given up here. And then there's a Gaussian distribution for X1 given X2, which means that we can think of X1 minus W1 X2 as the independent Gaussian random variable nu1 with mean zero. And finally, we can think of this term as a random variable that's given by x3 minus w3 x2 x2 and that random variable is called nu3 and it is independent of all the other ones. Here are these three Gaussians. So here I've already put these into the exponential. Of course, Gaussian distributions, the product of three Gaussian distributions is the product of three exponential functions that are that contain a square in the exponential that's equal to the, to the exponential of a sum of these individual squares. Here are these three squares. This is the term from x2. This is the term from x1, given x2. And this is the term from x3, given x2. Now, x1, 2, and 3 actually show up in, like, jointly in all three of these terms. It's not that this is a term about x1, and this only about x, x, uh, x2, and this about x1, and this only about x3. No, there is an x2 in here and an x2 in here, because we are conditioning on x2. So let's rearrange these terms so that we get all the bits with x2 on one side and all the bits with x3 on one side and all the mixture terms with x2 and x3 or x3 and x1 and so on on one side. In doing so, we are implicitly inverting the covariance matrix of this joint distribution because we're going to get actually a shape of this distribution as a joint Gaussian distribution with an inner product, containing an inner product in the exponential with a matrix, and that matrix is the inverse of the covariance matrix by definition of the Gaussian. So if we do that, then basically we have to expand these squares here and there, plug it, uh, get these individual terms. So here are all the bits with x2. There is one where there is no w in here. And then there is a square in x2 from here and a square in, in, with w3 from here. And then um, there is an independent term for x1. And then there are mixture terms for x1 and x2. This arrives from here. And a mixture term with x3 and x2 that arises from here. And a an, uh, term only in x3. If you rearrange this, then we can see that we can write this expression using this matrix. So this is the precision matrix of our Gaussian. And this matrix tells us that x1 and x3 become independent when conditioned on x2. There are two different ways to see this. One is the sort of mechanical pedestrian way. Imagine that x2 is set to a particular value. That's what conditioning means. That means that all the terms in this matrix that show up along here, along this cross, basically, are now fixed to certain numbers. Or actually, these terms also show up up here. Right? So now if you look at these expressions, so everything here is now a constant, because we've set x2 to something. And in this term, and in this term, you can think of x2 as a constant now as well. Now notice that there is no term in here that contains an x1 and an x3 together in this sum. There's only a term in x1, and this is a constant, right? So this is only a function of x1 now. And there's only a function of x3, and they're separate from each other. Another way to see this is that there is a 0 on the off-diagonal entry here. This means that if we keep x2 fixed, then this expression factorizes into two, prod, like two uh, factors in a product, one depending only on x1 and one depending only on x3. That's exactly what conditional independence means. So what we can tell from here is that um, to find marginal independence, we have to look at the marginal variance. So we get that by plugging out parts of the, of the matrix. And that means if there is a zero in the covariance matrix, then two variables, the two variables identified by the index of this location in the matrix, are independent of each other. Conditional independence can be read off, at least in part, from the precision matrix. A zero in the precision matrix implies that these two variables are independent of each other when conditioned on everything else in the model. So here we only have three variables, which means this zero means these two variables become independent of each other when conditioned on that one other variable. 
if we had multiple variables and we wanted to make statements about conditional independence, we would f about certain ones, we first have to marginalize out all the other variables that we don't care about. How to do that with Gaussians you now know. And, and if you don't, then think about it. And then do this inversion, this three by three inversion essentially. This is example number one, how we can read off conditional independence and marginal dependence from the covariance and precision matrices. Now let's do a second example with another graphical model and another physical example. Let's say we want to reason about the costs that go into uh, the price of electricity. So let's say you're a consumer, you've got a contract with a provider that uh, makes electricity for you, like the, the um, utility in Tübingen, for example, the Stadtwerke. <coughs> and let's say, for the simplicity of the argument, that this electricity is produced by uh, burning gas in a gas turbine and um, that there's essentially just two things, just two sources of price that go into this process. One is the emission price for the ton of CO2 that the utility has to pay and the other is the price of the gas when they actually buy it from the, from, uh, the market. Now, one thing you might be interested in is given that you know what you're paying for your electricity and what other people are paying for their electricity, very roughly what their price structure might be, how much they are paying for gas and for emissions. So um, this is another graphical model, which we again can write in terms of three independent Gaussian random variables. We begin with an independent Gaussian random variable for the gas price, so something we don't know. Right? We, let's call that new one and um, give it a Gaussian distribution. And then there's a second variable, let's call it x3, which is the emission price. And that's again Gaussian distributed with a mean and a variance. And these two things are independent of each other. Let's just say that's the case. Which is maybe not so bad an assumption. And now our electricity price will consist of a weighted sum of these two quantities and then a little bit of a disturbance that has something to do with the, with the decisions of the utility about how they construct their price. So by seeing our particular electricity price, we might be a little bit above or below what that sum actually is, depending on how the utility actually makes their price. So, um, uh, yeah, one thing to note at this point is that these weights that we now are going to, are going to have here, so our price, is a weight times the gas price plus another weight times the emission price um, plus a disturbance. Now, a few questions you could think about for yourself is, first of all, what you, you might have, if you're sort of econom economically inclined, you might have been thinking when I do this, this when I set up this, uh, this situation, that of course, yeah, but of course, I mean, these, the utilities, of course, wants to make a profit, so, so they're, what you're paying in price isn't actually the sum of these two, it's the sum of these two plus something else, which is the profit margin. Of course, that's true. And what that just means is that new two in general, the mean of this new of this sorry new two, this the mean of new two is not going to be zero. It's going to be something positive. That's the margin. A second thing you might notice if you're more physically inclined is that W1 and W3 are not going to be one in general because we're not just summing up these two prices. These two things are measured in quite different quantities. So this. Um, we're going to see in a moment gas prices, the gas is sold on the international market in terms of so-called British thermal units uh, and, and paid for in US dollars and the um, uh, emission price has something to do with the uh, euros per ton of CO2 but the ton of CO2 doesn't directly translate into electricity, right? So we really have to think about what the transformation process is from these quantities into ours. This is a typical situation in all, in all reasoning with physical quantities. Things have units of measure and when we talk about such relationships we have to be careful that these scaling factors W1 and W3 actually capture the physical process right. Okay, that much to the setup of the problem. Now we can do the same thing as before. We can introduce um, we can talk now about the derived variables x1, x3 and, x2, uh, and x2 and derive a, a joint Gaussian distribution that arises from this generative kind of process. We do that by again using an independent Gaussian distribution over nu1, nu2, u3 and then thinking of the correct linear map A that maps from nu to x. I haven't put that map here, I'm sure you can think of it for yourself, maybe stop the video for a moment. <laughs> 
If you do that and use again the rules of how to transform Gaussians under linear, under linear maps, or how to transform Gaussian random variables under linear maps into new Gaussian random variables, then you'll end up with this distribution, where x is now our variable x, the mean is something that is given by a times mu1, mu2, mu3, mu mu and a is that matrix we, I haven't written down. And there is a new covariance matrix which is given by this structure. Now we notice that there is a zero in the entry 1, 3 of this covariance matrix. And you can think for yourself for a second what that means. It means that the marginal distribution of x1 and x3 is independent. That the two terms x1 and x3, if we marginalize out x2, become independent of each other. That's exactly what we wanted our model to encode. Um, we can see that down here, the marginal distribution over x1 and x3 is given by another application of this Gaussians are closed under linear maps property to compute the marginal distribution, which is pick out the entries mu1, mu3, and sigma1, sig 0, and sigma3. And we see that they are independent of each other. Now, we know from lecture two that this gra graphical model, which represents this process, also has an interesting conditional dependent structure. So even though x1 and x3 are independent in the marginal, once we condition on x2, they will become in general dependent on each other. Let's see if the Gaussians actually, the, this Gaussian model can capture this kind of structure. And of course it can. So here is our graph again from before, copied over. This is our structure again, copied over from the previous slide. Now we write down the joint distribution over x1, x2, and x3 using this structure, which amounts to saying there is this independent variable called mu1, which directly uh, affects x1. Then there is this independent variable x3, which directly affects x3. And then x2 is actually not an independent random variable, but there is an independent random variable called mu2, and it's given by x2 minus w1, x1 minus w3, x3. And that is independent, so there's another term in here, which is called p of x2 given x1 and x3. And that's what this graphical model actually represents. So this is our joint Gaussian. Again, oh, there's a square missing. OK, I'll have to fix that later. So there's a square here and a square there, and then a bracket around this with a square above. OK? So, um, I've just plugged in these values, right? This is, this is just the explicit form of the probability density function, of the Gaussian probability density function arising from multiplying the three Gaussians here together. Now in the next line, things are correct. Here I fixed my typos. So now we can just go through and check for all the terms with x1 and bring, that, bring those on one side. So we redistribute these brackets. We'll get an x1 square that depends on one over sigma square. And then from in here, there will be a w1 square x1 square term that shows up here. Similarly for x2, there is a simple term that only comes from here. There's nothing else with a square on x2, but there are a bunch of mixture terms with x1 and x2 and x3 and x2. And they show up here and there. And then there's another mixture term with x3 and x1 because there's also a term in here where they mix. That's over here. And then we have an individual term of x3 squared, one from the independent term and one from this conditional distribution over here. If you rearrange this expression into an inner product with a matrix inside, we are implicitly computing the inverse of the covariance matrix, and that inverse looks like this. And now we can see that there, is, there are non-zero entries in general everywhere in this matrix. What this means is that if we condition on any of these variables, then the other two variables are always in general dependent on each other unless the corresponding terms in this matrix are actually zero, and this corresponds to certain values for w1 and w3. In particular, we can see that if we condition on x2, so if we keep x2 constant in this expression up here, then there is still a term where x1 and x3 depend on each other. And, um, It um, contains this expression up here. So, oh, there's another bug in here. Annoying. This should be a plus. Okay, I'll fix this in the in in the in the slides. 
Because there's a plus here, here it is correct. There is a plus in this, uh, around this term. There's a positive number in here, which means, at first sight, you might think that means that these two, these two quantities become correlated when conditioned on x2. But it's actually the other way around. So think of this term. Now let's say we want to keep the probability for this constant. Then this means if x1 gets larger, x3 has to become smaller. And if x3 gets larger, x1 has to become smaller for the term to remain constant, right? So this means if there's a positive term in the matrix here, this corresponds to a negative correlation between the variables x1 and x3 when conditioned on x2. So let's see how this works out if we actually do Bayesian inference to reproduce this kind of structure as you would expect it. And for that, I'm, we could do two things. We could write down the form of this distribution over x1 and x2 if we, if we just keep x2 fixed. And that's essentially taking this function here and just treating everything that contains an x2 as a constant. So that means there will be a quantity in x1 uh, and x1 square. So this is going to be a function, a part of the function. This is a constant. Here we have a linear term in x1 that depends otherwise just on constants and then a quadratic term in x3 and then here a linear term in x3 with a constant and then there a complicated term combining x1 and x3. We can also go back alternatively and use the general rule from this slide down here and say what we're doing here is we could do Gaussian inference on the quantities called x1 and x3 given the quantity x2. And this amounts to taking, uh, considering what the, what, uh, like how we can write sort of linear maps B and A to get our corresponding correct variables. So here we have a quantity X that has three different entries and Y is just picking out one of them. So our A is going to be a row vector that has 0, 1, 0 and to pick out X2 and then we can measure Y with some Gaussian noise in general. And um, afterwards, we'll have to compute a posterior about maybe just x1 and x3. So for that, we need a b, which just picks out, um, it's another row vector with 1, 0, 1 that picks out the entries uh, 1 and 3. And then we can assume that uh, b is 0 and c is 0 because we're not shifting any measurements. And then th what we're getting here will tell us directly what the, what the posterior is. So let's do that which amounts to the same thing as keeping, taking this function, keeping all the terms in x1, x2 uh, constant to a particular value and then um, rewriting until we get a Gaussian distribution. So um, actually this one. So here is the situation again. Now I've actually picked reasonably realistic numbers. So um, if, you, if you look up sort of online what, what the prices are for these corresponding uh, quantities, then you can see that typical prices for the ton of CO2 range in, on the order of something between 15 and 20 um, or between 10 and 25 euros per ton, which is supposedly way too low to have an effect. And the price for gas is on the order of something like outside of Corona times at least on the order of something like five US dollars for uh, per um, million British thermal units. That's what the quantity is actually used for. So notice that these are very different physical quantities and I've captured um, I, a sort of a very vague assumption over what their correct values are in a Gaussian distribution. Now let's say we make an observation. We observe that we are um, paying let's say something on the order of uh, um, 30 cents per kilowatt hour for our, for our electricity price and um, for our electricity. So we could predict actually what kind of value we are expecting for the price of electricity by computing first the marginal distribution over x2. So that's what our model would suggest the price would be. We can get that by finding the right values to map from x1 and x3 to x2 and those will contain numbers that actually map from the, from the correct physical quantities to the price that we are paying. So maybe we can actually do that briefly on the, on the whiteboard. I have some numbers here so that, I, so that you get a feeling for how this actually works. So it turns out that one 
a million British thermal units, this is how this is abbreviated, right, correspond in, if you burn them, so gas, gas burning is almost perfect, right, in terms of heat uh, produced, uh, uh, 293 kilowatt hours of energy, and um, so a dollar is something like 0.93, euros at the moment, I just looked that up, which means that this quantity x1, the price of gas, is um, uh, equal to sort of, well, w, w1 in our computation is the uh, number we need to get from dollars per million British thermal units to euros per kilowatt hour and that's going to be essentially 0.93 divided by 293 um, and then we just need the right thing euro per dollar divided by British million British thermal units by kilowatt hour and this is something like, that's a pretty small number, 0.003. And if we actually want to talk about cents, then um, we just have to take hundreds of, of euros, right? So then we can just get rid of two of these uh, zeros. And W2 comes from um, the, so our, the, other, the other quantity we talk about is the uh, CO2 emissions price. For that we need to know how much CO2 is produced when burning gas to, um, uh, um, to make electricity. And uh, you can find different numbers online, but actually it turns out that there's a very rough correspondence of um, kilograms of gas, sorry, kilograms of CO2 produced when burning gas two kilowatt hours. So there's very roughly um, sort of one, a correspondence of um, um, one kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour when burning gas. And uh, so this is 0.001 tons of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And uh, we already have euros, so we don't have to hear very much about this. So W2 is just going to be 0.001, very roughly speaking. Right? So now let's see, let's say we observe that we are paying 30 cents to the kilowatt hour. That, um, so notice how these two numbers are comparable to each other. They're not the same, but they're comparable to each other on, in terms of size, which is why this linear function here becomes sort of has a slope that is uh, not all that steep, actually. So when we observe our x2, x2 is a variable that lies on this um, uh, rank deficient subspace, essentially. We can only measure how far we are in this direction. That's where our price um, is actually measured. Right, because in this direction, along this direction, if I can show it like this, the uh, two quantities we care about that make up, that whose sum makes up our, our electricity price actually quo. So um, if we now measure what our, what our price actually is um, up to some measurement noise, which might come from the fact that we don't really know how this relates to what they are paying. And also maybe, um, yeah, we don't really know how they make their price. So if you make our measurement, then this corresponds to observing, um, well, this kind of picture, observing the value, but also um, getting a value for our likelihood function. So the likelihood for x2 given x1 and x3 is given by this Gaussian function that we had on the previous slide. We now know what x2 is, but we want to know what x1 and x3 is. To do so, you can now think about this in three different ways. One is pictorially, so you can think of multiplying this Gaussian with this degenerate rank one subspace Gaussian, which is itself a Gaussian distribution because of the symmetry of uh, Gaussians around their mean. And if you just multiply these two Gaussians with each other, because the product of two Gaussians is another Gaussian, we will get a posterior Gaussian distribution. And I can already show you that it looks like this. That's the new posterior Gaussian we're going to get. Another way to think about this is to go back one slide and look at this expression here and treat this as a function of W1 and W3, where W2 is now a constant that we've observed. Then um, you can rearrange 
and uh, see that we uh, well get out a function that depends on x1 and x3, and that's all posterior. It's a little bit tedious to do so, but it's a mechanical way to do so. A mathematical way to do so that's a bit more formal is to go to our slide with uh, posterior forms and read off the posterior distribution. Which way around you do it doesn't matter, you always end up with the same posterior. So here I've actually done the computation, you can look at this later, for the actual uh, like using the, the formula for the, for the posterior distribution from the previous slides. Now, the one thing you can see is that given the observation, given the blue thing, our likelihood, the posterior distribution, the, the gray dark thing that you see as a cloud here, is anti-correlated. So the two variables, x1 and x3, given the observation, become negatively correlated with each other. And that's what we saw before, right? Um, that makes sense because if you observe a certain price, then you can explain that in different ways by combining these two quantities, the two things that create the price, the gas price and the emission price, but they have, if one goes up, the other one has to go down, of course. All right, so an oft, a, a, a non-zero term in the off-diagonal of the precision matrix, of the inverse covariance matrix, corresponds to the exact other sign of correlation. A positive term corresponds to negative correlation, a negative term corresponds to positive correlation. This is the end of the lecture. Today I've introduced Gaussian distributions as a general tool for inference. We haven't done much practicing, practice stuff with this yet, if you're waiting for the applications, if you've been wondering how this course is going to turn into an applied, uh, usable set of tools, wait no longer than next lecture where we're going to address this issue and then we will quickly construct really useful algorithms. Today, I introduced Gaussian distributions as an algebraic tool that maps the complicated conceptual process of probabilistic inference onto linear algebra. And this works because Gaussians are the exponentials of squares and square functions have really wonderful properties. The sum of two squares is another square and therefore products of Gaussians are Gaussians. A cut through a, Gauss through a quadratic function is a quadratic function, so therefore conditionals of Gaussians are Gaussians. And a projection of a quadratic function is a quadratic function and therefore Gaussian marginals are Gaussians and all linear projections of Gaussian random variables are also Gaussian random variables. Therefore, the sum and the product rule are sort of reproduced, or if we do, if we use the sum and product rule in linear Gaussian models, then we always stay within this Gaussian framework and all the computations we have to do are just linear algebra. Therefore, I'm going to say in the rest of the lecture, Gaussians provide the linear algebra of inference or they map inference onto linear algebra. We now did these two examples to give a concrete, very, very basic, and simple, um, hopefully convincing example of how the structure of conditional independence that we saw in lecture two maps onto the real case with Gaussians. In particular, we saw that um, to find marginal independence, we have to look at the covariance matrix and its entries, and to find conditional independence, we have to look at the inverse covariance matrix, also known as the precision matrix, and of zero, uh, of diagonal zero entries there. An off-diagonal entry in the precision matrix the off, that is positive corresponds to negative correlation given all the other variables and the other way around and a zero there corresponds to conditional independence. In the covariance matrix a zero on the off-diagonal corresponds to marginal independence of these two quantities. This lecture was maybe a lot of just algebra but I find this really important because Gaussians are going to be a very key to part of our toolbox. Here is our toolbox again that I've introduced a few lectures ago. This is the sort of stuff you carry around with you as a machine learning engineer as you go to work and the Gaussians play an extremely important role in this toolbox. You know how every good craftsman actually no matter what their trade is, what they're particularly working on, in their toolbox, among all their specialist tools, they will always have like a box of wrenches that just, and screwdrivers, right, that just apply to everything because everyone has faced with uh, having to loosen nuts and bolts and, uh, and turn screws. The Gaussians are going to be that part of your toolbox. It's actually a little own toolbox in itself that you take out to do generic work. Whenever you don't know what else to use, you're gonna use that wrench that is inside of your Gaussian toolbox because Gaussian distributions map everything you then need to do 
onto linear algebra, which we're going to use as a very, very generic computational tool. Why? Because computers are extremely good at linear algebra. So I'm looking forward to see you in the next lecture when we finally get to talk about even the slightest possible real-world applications. Thank you for your time.